Hi, my name is Hunter Freeman, and this is video 29 of a video series in which I write a text editor from scratch. I currently have open the finished result of what will be at the end of this video because I did it on a separate branch and then I'm going to change branches so we can do it again. And what the result is will be a finalized custom virtualization component that virtualizes uh, horizontally and vertically. And what I currently have open here in the text editor is the entirety of the play Hamlet in a .html file. And there's 8,880 lines of text. This previously uh, took us over a second to render. We are now down to 78 milliseconds to render this. And you can see on the left, I have the web inspector open as it's called uh, in this program. And everything has a top, a height and a left and so on. So you'll see when I scroll, uh, everything kind of turns this greenish color, which indicates that the content is being swapped out for what is at the current scroll position. And then I'll scroll to the very bottom. You can see as I scroll, everything's changing. And then we get to the very bottom, 8,880 lines of text, and we hit the end of file. And then again, this top becomes large because it's every single row is being multiplied by the height of a row in order to place it correctly. So with that being said, I will swap my branch and then we can do this again from scratch. Okay, so I swap my branch to the one that we left off from video 28 on. And what we'll do is we'll just finish up what we started in the previous video. Uh, Cause the previous video was where we started this virtualization component and now we're just going to go and finish it. So let's do that. One of the things that I did not get to in the previous video was I'll give a like 10 second rundown of what's going on here in case you didn't see the previous video, uh, but I don't want to harp on what the previous video was about. Uh, so in this Razor library, this .cs proj, we have a text editor folder. It contains the text editor display. We have a for loop in the text editor display that renders out a gutter div as well a row that contains the actual text that you see. As well in this Razorlib C Sharp project, we have a folder for virtualization. In virtualization, there are a file named classes.cs. We have a virtualization entry of type T. It's got the index in the original list, the item itself, and width, height, left, top, all of those in pixels virtualization scroll position. So what is the scroll left? What is the scroll top? And then we calculate what, what should be rendered from that. So the virtualization request will have on it the scroll position when the JavaScript event gets fired, as well it will have a cancellation token because if there's a more recent scroll event, you want to just ignore the previous ones. We have a virtualization result which has a immutable array of the virtualization entries and the positioning that the consumer of this component wants me to put the four virtualization boundaries. These boundaries are being observed by the JavaScript intersection observer API. And whenever these boundaries, these virtualization boundaries Whenever they come into view, an event, in a sense, is fired. If I were to simplify it a bit, uh, 
for conciseness. And we can then listen to that and then say, we need to change the content that is being rendered to the screen. So we make a virtualization request to the consumer of the component. We get the new virtualization result. We iterate over the entries and we put the virtualization boundaries where the consumer wants because we want to have varying height for the entries. And the result of that is we cannot predict where to put the virtualization boundaries. So for example, this code lens in Rider and you don't know where this is going to show up. So you cannot predict as the component writer uh, component designer maybe is a better word because it sounds kind of similar to writer. Uh, so we writing the component cannot predict where to put these virtualization boundaries because we want varying height. So the consumer needs to tell us that. A virtualization boundary has a width in pixels, height in pixels, left in pixels, top in pixels. If any of these values are null, then we uh, put the width as, for example, the virtualization boundary has a nullable double for the width in pixels. If the width in pixels has a value, then we string interpolate into the style CSS attribute for the virtualization boundary div element when we render that boundary, we string interpolate with colon with colon and then it would be the boundary object dot width in pixels and then a px. If it is null, if this width in pixels is null, then we will do width colon 100%. So the virtualization boundary is just a div with a CSS class so that we can apply position absolute. The style is, as I said, being interpolated and I'll F12 to this get style CSS string. We have a style builder. We have a width being interpolated or being set to 100% if the value were null. Uh, we have a height, we have a left, we have a top. That then gets dot two stringed because it's a string builder, and then we, we return that. The virtualization boundary display takes two parameters. It takes the virtualization boundary, which is the class that if I F12 has all of those width and pixels, height and pixels, left and top, so on. We also need a way to identify what boundary we are looking at. Whenever a boundary comes into view, we need to know which boundary came into view. So we put a virtualization boundary display ID uh, as the ID attribute in the dot razor file for these boundary display divs. This way we know which boundary came into view when the intersection observer uh, fires its event, saying that a boundary came into view. And then the last thing, in terms of the uh, Blazor and C-sharp part, there's a JavaScript file that I'll go to in a moment, but the virtualization display uh, is what the consumer would actually put on their page and this virtualization display has a div that does nothing other than allow us as the designer of the component to find the parent scrollable element that is expected to be there from the consumer of the component. The consumer of the component provides a scrollable div and then immediately as a child element, they will put the virtualization display. And then we have this div here that's empty that is just 
has an at ref underscore scrollable parent finder. And we can then say in JavaScript, well, underscore scrollable parent finder dot parent element dot scroll left dot scroll top. And now we know the scroll left and scroll top of the consumer's scrollable div or scrollable element. If they want horizontal virtualization, uh, these are parameters. So if they want horizontal virtualization, then we render the left and the right boundary. If they want vertical virtualization, then we render the top and the bottom boundary. I hit F7 to go to the code behind of virtualization display dot racer dot CS. And virtualization display is a generic component. It implements iDisposable. We need to inject the IGS runtime because there's a lot of JavaScript involved uh, as is necessary for the intersection observer. And there are two editor required parameters. Uh, and those are, the first one would be an entries provider func because we need to let the consumer of the component uh, know that the scroll event occurred. So we provide them with a request. They then return to us a virtualization result. And then the child content that we will actually, uh, when we iterate over all of the entries in the virtualization result, we will call the render fragment for each one of those entries and pass that for each loops variable at that iteration to the child content for each one of the entries to render out the child content. Um, there's also two last parameters. These are not editor required. And the first one is use horizontal virtualization. It is a Boolean that defaults to true. As well, there's use vertical virtualization. It's a Boolean that defaults to true. We get that element reference to the underscore scrollable parent finder. So I'll F7 again. And here we see uh, we have this empty div that just lets us find the parent scrollable element that was provided by the consumer of this component. We have a private read-only GUID for a intersection observer map key. If you have multiple virtualization displays being rendered simultaneously, you do not want them to clobber each other in terms of their states. So for that reason, you need to have a intersection observer map key so that every time that you invoke your JavaScript, you can look into a JavaScript map, uh, which is like a dictionary and say, for this given intersection observer map key, what are the variables associated with this specific virtualization display dot racer dot cs instance that I'm looking at as opposed to possibly many that are rendered you just narrow down using this key to the one you're interested in and get all the state for that individual virtualization display instance we store the uh, results after the user gives it back uh, that gives it back, but returns it from us invoking the entries provider func. As I said, uh, it has the entries and then the four virtualization boundaries. Where do we want to put them? The virtualization boundaries, I also said they all have an ID associated with them. So we know when the intersection observer finds that a boundary uh, in, in the simplistic way to say it, uh, came into view, we can know which one of the boundaries came into view. The virtualization display has an on after render async. It takes a Boolean for the first render as usual. 
uh, and we use that boolean for the first render so that we can initialize the intersection observer. So if they are using horizontal virtualization, then we add to a list of objects the left and the right virtualization boundaries. If they're using vertical virtualization, we add the top and the bottom virtualization boundaries. If they're using both, they get all four. And then we invoke the JavaScript uh, function named initialize intersection observer. That function resides on the window object named Blazor Text Editor virtualization. We give it the underscore intersection observer map key dot two string so that we can isolate the state for each one of these virtualization display instances, given that there could be many of them being rendered to the screen at the same time at different parts of the application. I need a .NET object reference because whenever the event is fired from JavaScript that says that a virtualization boundary is in the viewport, I need to do a callback to .NET and invoke specifically the name of the function, the name of the method that we have is on scroll event async. You see here it's JS invocable. I'll talk more about on scroll event async in a moment, but that's the name of the method that the JavaScript will invoke when it does the .NET interop. I believe they call it. Uh, if you reverse the direction. We also need the scrollable parent finder because we need to know what the scrollable uh, container is in the DOM so that we can look at the scroll left and the scroll top. And it is the case that the consumer of this component needs to provide the virtualization display the scrollable parent and that the virtualization display needs to be the, an, an immediate child of the scrollable parent. And we also give it the boundary IDs and that allows us to do document dot get element by ID uh, in the JavaScript. And then our intersection observer can iterate over these boundary IDs doing document dot get element by ID and then the result of document dot get element by ID we do intersection observer dot observe and then pass in the result of document dot get element by ID scroll on scroll event async is what the JavaScript is going to be invoking whenever the event fires so it needs to provide a scroll position so that we can pass that along to the consumer of this component. The scroll position is of data type virtualization scroll position. It has two doubles, the first being the scroll left in pixels and the second being scroll top in pixels. Lastly, we have a dispose that we are uh, implementing. And this is so that we can dispose of the intersection observer once this component uh, is no longer rendered. So let's now go to the JavaScript. We have a JavaScript file uh, and it is named Blazor Text Editor virtualization .js. I'll go over the dispose first because it's three lines of code. The dispose intersection observer function takes that intersection observer map key so we can isolate the states of the various virtualization displays that might be rendered simultaneously. And 
inside of this function, we can look into a JavaScript map, which is uh, very similar to a dictionary in C sharp. And we give it the key and we get out the intersection observer that corresponds. And I believe this is uh, from the final video. I believe that this is slightly incorrect and that we have to change it, but we'll get there when we get there. But the general gist of it is written here, albeit I, I believe slightly wrong. Uh, and then we delete the entry from the intersection observer map. And then the idea is that you would get your intersection observer from the map using your key and then you would disconnect and then you're done. Uh, but this is actually wrong. Not that I'm looking at it, but we'll get there. Uh, it's, it's only slightly wrong. You'll see that the map has a different thing in it than what the dispose is assuming is there. So in Blazor text editor, virtualization.js at the top, we have the window uh, uh, dot blaze your text editor virtualization. So we're adding this blaze your text editor virtualization object onto the window. This object has a JavaScript property of intersection observer map, and it's getting initialized to a new map. Therefore, we can share this intersection observer map amongst all of the instances of the virtualization display. And each one of the virtualization displays can isolate its state by using its intersection observer map key whenever it invokes the JavaScript. When you want to initialize the intersection observer, you give it your intersection observer map key. And just as a real quick uh, reminder, in the virtualization display dot razor dot CS, we have on after render async. If it's the first render, then we invoke this initialize intersection observer JavaScript function, which is what we're going to talk about right now. This function takes the key that identifies the virtualization display. It takes the virtualization display as a .NET object reference. I'll go to the virtualization display code behind. So that's just a matter of saying .NET object reference dot create and then passing this when you are in the code behind for the virtualization display. Additionally, we want the scrollable parent finder so we can see the scroll left and the scroll top of the parent and the in the usual case, we'll see that we have four boundary IDs because we have the left boundary, the right, the top, and the bottom. But you could specify that you only want horizontal virtualization or you only want vertical virtualization. So the first step in initialized intersection observer is to say scrollable parent finder dot parent element. We then can say scrollable parent dot add event listener. Whenever uh, that parent element has a scroll event on capture, that's what this true is for. Uh, we want to invoke our, our uh, Lambda that we're providing here. And we have not written that in the previous episode, so we'll do it in this one. We need to make an intersection observer instance. You see the new intersection observer is being uh, written out here. Prior to making that intersection observer though, prior to calling the constructor for the intersection observer, I need to make a variable for the intersection observer options. And we're going to say that the root element that we want to uh, be relative to is the scrollable parent. The root margin is zero and the threshold is zero. So specifically what this means is anytime 
that the intersection observer notices a boundary went from being unvisible to being visible, it will fire off its event. And specifically, what that means is when you new up your intersection observer, you see here, you give it a callback. And the intersection observer event, so to speak, is that the intersection observer will invoke your callback. So it's important to know, I am fairly certain it's the case that the intersection observer only calls your callback when the threshold is passed over. So you have to go from 0 to 0 0.1 in order to fire this intersection observer. If you then go from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, you will not fire the intersection observer. I'm very confident about that, uh, but I never want to say with certainty about anything. And because of the fact that I find that the intersection observer works that way, I need to store the intersection ratio every time that this callback is uh, invoked by the intersection observer because the intersection observer passes to this callback all of the entries, all of the HTML elements that are being observed by this specific intersection observer any of those elements that passed over your threshold, and you can have an array of these uh, for your threshold, but any elements that passed over your threshold will be passed to you uh, to this callback. And it's any elements that have passed over the threshold since the last time that the intersection observer invoked the callback. So in the callback for the intersection observer, I get my intersection observer map. I do a dot get using my key so I can get my state for my specific instance of the virtualization display. I then iterate over all of the entries that have passed over my threshold and I find in this array that I'm maintaining of all of the boundaries, all of the virtualization boundaries, I'm maintaining them in an array, so to speak. So that way I can say this specific virtualization boundary has an intersection ratio of zero. And perhaps I'm saying uh, the left virtualization boundary has an intersection ratio of zero, meaning 0% zero of that uh, HTML element is visible versus 0.5 would be 50% of it is visible. And you see here, I am capturing every time that one of my virtualization boundaries passes my threshold, I grab the intersection ratio from the intersection observer's entry that it passed to me, and then I maintain that intersection ratio as state on at the top of the page. I'll hit control home. I put that inside this intersection observer map because, like I said, it is seemingly the case that the intersection observer only fires once you uh, pass over a threshold, not, I'll leave it at, uh, it only happens when you pass over a threshold. So because of that, you can have a virtualization boundary in view and not end up firing the event to get new content from the consumer of your component. For that reasoning, you need to do an add event listener 
so that every time that the user scrolls, you check not only if a virtualization boundary came in the view, but you check to see if a virtualization boundary was in view, then you also need to uh, update the content. Not just when it comes in the view, but also if it uh, was in the view when they scrolled. And then you see here, uh, I'm at the callback for the intersection observer at the bottom. It says, uh, I scroll too far. Uh, so the callback at the bottom, I have this Boolean that I'm maintaining and it's getting set to if the intersection ratio was greater than zero, then we have something intersecting. We have something uh, visible, so to say, and therefore we fire on the virtualization display dot net object reference. We dot invoke method async to call back to dot net. And then we invoke on scroll event async by putting that method name in quotes. And then we have comma. We have a JavaScript object. And this JavaScript object has two properties on it. One of them being the scroll left in pixels, which is equal to the scrollable parent dot scroll left. And then the second property is the scroll top in pixels which is equal to the scroll parent that scroll top. We also provide the options because this entire bit of code that I was looking at was the constructor for the intersection observer. Here you see I make my array of, I called it boundary ID intersection ratio tuples. So I have this, uh, I'm calling it a tuple, but I think that is not the correct wording when it comes to JavaScript, um, it seems like it's just an object uh, in JavaScript terms, but I have this JavaScript object in this boundary ID intersection ratio tuples array that it's, it's initially empty, but I do a for loop over all of the boundary IDs and I push onto this array of boundary ID intersection ratio tuples in a JavaScript object that has two properties. It has a boundary ID, which would be boundary IDs at I, and it has an intersection ratio that starts at zero. After I do that, I say I set into the intersection observer map, which is like a dictionary. I do a dot set. The key is the intersection observer map key. And then the value is a JavaScript object with two properties. The first being the intersection observer and the second being the boundary ID intersection ratio tuples. So with that being said, we can get started here. I want to iterate over the child content because that was not done in the previous video. So in virtualization display dot razor dot CS, we see we have the child content. So uh, I will just go in order, even though I see something wrong, I'll just go in a logical order uh, and then I'll fix what's wrong when we get to it so that there's kind of a story that's being told. Uh, in the virtualization display dot razor, we need to do at for each var entry in underscore result dot entries. This is the virtualization result. We can then do at child content and pass into the child content render fragment the given entry that we are iterating with. Uh, that turned out to be the iteration variable. Um, the issue, however, is we want a virtualization entry of type T uh, to be passed into the child content, but the child content is of type T. So we'll just 
change the type of the render fragment to virtualization result of T. The reason you want, uh, you can sort of see here that virtualization result, I used the wrong type. I meant to say virtualization entry. So let me uh, fix this error real quick. And now I'll show you that the error went away and then I'll tell you uh, two seconds about what virtualization entry is. So we see the uh, error went away. I go to virtualization entry. The short of it is that we want to know what index we're at so that we can uh, use that to render out the line numbers. So there's this wrapping class for the actual data type that the user wants to render so that they know the index and where to position the item and things like that. So that will result in us rendering uh, the content by iterating over the result. I need to write the logic for on scroll event async. So I'll go to the code behind, which would be virtualization display dot razor dot CS. I control F on scroll event async. And in here, what I would want to do is leverage cancellation tokens so that if a more recent on scroll event async occurs, then my consumer can ignore the older, uh, on scroll events. So let's make a cancellation token source up at the top of this file as a field. So I'll make a private cancellation token source and I will name it underscore scroll event cancellation token source. So underscore scroll event cancellation token source equals new and Immediately before I continue, I want to go to the dispose method and make sure that I cancel this uh, cancellation token source before I forget, almost like uh, unsubscribing from an uh, event handler. So I go to the control end to go to the bottom of the file. And prior to this uh, fire and forget task.run, I want to put underscore scroll event cancellation token source dot cancel so that I let the consumer know we're not even rendered anymore. So you don't have to take time to calculate what needs to be rendered. Uh, you can just ignore this is what that's for. And in the on scroll event async, I additionally want to cancel it there because what I'm saying is there's a more recent one underscore scroll event cancellation token source would thereby need to be nude uh, because we just canceled it on the previous line. So we needed a new instance. So we do underscore scroll event cancellation token source dot cancel. And then we do an assignment to underscore scroll event cancellation token source as a new version of it. And then we can say var and specifically I'm going to call it underscore request. And then this is a field that we don't have yet. So I'll uh, refactor create this field in a moment. But I'm going to make a request object out of this scroll position that was passed to the on scroll event async JavaScript invocable method from the JavaScript. And I also want to uh, take a snapshot of a token from this cancellation token source. So underscore request equals new virtuali virtualization request. And in here, I control shift space to show the parameters to this uh, method. In this case, it's a constructor. And then I want to put the scroll position. So I put that and then I put a comma and then I want to put a cancellation token. So I would put underscore scroll event cancellation token source dot token. And now, like I said, we don't have underscore request. So I can control period and then refactor to create this field. 
and I don't want to get a null reference exception. Uh, perhaps that wouldn't happen. I gotta think about this for a moment. I was going to say we need to set a default value for this, uh, that is to say initialize it so that we don't get a null reference exception, but we can actually just say null not, and we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but this will always have a value uh, because the JavaScript is going to provide us with the scroll position and then we'll make this and then we'll uh, ask and then we'll invoke entries provider func. So we want to write up this public void method for invoke entries provider func. So let's do that. And what I want to do here is say underscore result is equal to entries provider func dot invoke and then I do underscore request. This is a public method because all that the underscore request is doing is it's storing the scroll position. So I look at it as though if your content changes, but your scroll position does not change, the consumer of this component could then use at ref to get a field reference to the virtualization display component and then say underscore virtualization display dot invoke entries provider func to force a reload of the data even though a scroll event never happened and it will just reuse the previous request that was most recent uh, the virtualized component uh, that Microsoft provides, I believe, has reload data async. So that's what I'm. That's uh, pretty much what I'm doing here, uh, giving away for the user to reload the data by making this public. In Blazor Text Editor, virtualization.js. When we do initialize intersection observer at the very bottom, right before we uh, end up leaving this function uh, and returning from it, we need to actually invoke on scroll event async to perform the initial render. And I will say for 10 seconds, uh, I don't want to say much because uh, I don't know if it's confusing uh, the way I'm wording it. But a minute ago, I was talking about this private virtualization request, underscore request, and then I was going to initialize it to a new virtualization request because I didn't want a null reference exception. However, I believe it is the case we could just say null not because of this step uh, that we just got to, which is to say on after render, we immediately uh, force a initial on scroll event async therefore the underscore request should never be null I still think that there's like a, a very atomic edge case where you could call it prior to on after render async finishing that is to say this public invoke entries provider func but I can look into that later but for now that that's what I was referring to so, in Blazor Text Editor virtualization.js, like I said, let's do that initial invocation of the on scroll event to let, uh, and this will just say zero 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 for scroll left, zero for scroll top, because it's it's the initial load. Or if uh, they have the scroll bar at a different position when they load the page, that also would just be whatever it was at. So, here it is. I added it, 
we do virtualization display dot net object reference dot invoke method async the string on scroll event async is passed in and then the JavaScript object that contains the scroll left in pixels and the scroll top in pixels. I need to write the logic for at control home to go to the top of the page. We have this scrollable parent dot add event listener scroll. So we need to actually write this in. It would be let has intersecting intersecting boundary uh, set the false. So this is going to allow us to know whether or not after we've finished iterating over all of the uh, virtualization boundaries, were any of them in viewport. So we need to also say, I'll copy and paste this from the callback for the intersection observer. I need to grab from the intersection observer map using my key to get my state. So this is intersection observer map value that I'm grabbing as a variable. It does not just contain the intersection observer. It also contains as a second JavaScript property in array that each one of those entries in the array has two properties. The first being the element ID comma the intersection ratio that was last measured. So I can then say now that I have my state for my specific virtualization display, I want to say for uh, let i equal to zero, i less than, I'm going to copy and paste this just because it's a long variable name, but I want to say for i equal to zero, I less than intersection observer map value dot boundary ID intersection ratio tuples dot length and then I plus plus. I want to uh, do inside of this for loop let boundary tuple equal intersection observer map value dot boundary ID intersection ratio tuples at I and you notice I'm copying and pasting a lot from the callback for the intersection observer it's because these uh, the scroll event and the intersection observer callback are incredibly similar um, so this last bit that I need here uh, maybe one more thing after this uh, but it would be if this boundary tuple dot intersection ratio is greater than zero, then it's in the viewport. So that means we need to tell the consumer uh, of the blazer component to give us uh, the new content given the scroll position. After this for loop is done, we can then say if we found in intersecting boundary during that for loop then we can invoke on scroll event async that is to say call back to the dot net and give it the scroll left and the scroll top I don't want to get sidetracked but it looks like I could put a return to return early I believe in this if statement but anyhow In the previous video, uh, I'm going to scroll down a bit in this Blazor text editor virtualization.js, and we have this for loop in which we are pushing onto the boundary ID intersection ratio tuples, uh, the ID of the boundary, comma, the intersection ratio of zero, uh, which is that that initial value that we're going to set for that intersection ratio. We also need to actually end up calling intersection observer dot observe and then pass into it the boundary HTML element itself that never was done in the previous video so I'll show you what I mean so in this for loop uh, we have we have the uh, boundary ID because we're iterating over the boundary IDs so let me 
just make a variable at this boundary IDs at I. I'll actually just copy and paste uh, boundary IDs at I because I don't want to make a variable named boundary ID when the list is boundary IDs that is probably going to result in me making a typo and uh, JavaScript won't give me that uh, type safety. So I'm worried about that. So I'll just put the index operator in both places. So now I have uh, in this for loop, not only do I do that push into that array of the intersection ratio tuples thing, I say let boundary element equal document dot get element by ID and then I pass into get element by ID the boundary IDs at I. So for example, perhaps this boundary IDs at I would be left virtualization boundary, then it would be right virtualization boundary, then top, then bottom. That's what this guy is, this boundaries at I. Now I have the boundary element and one of the key things to do when using the intersection observer is to say intersection observer dot observe boundary element because if you don't call this dot observe uh, I, I believe it would just end up doing nothing uh, it certainly wouldn't fire your callback so let's see that looks good in text editor display dot razor I want to actually use the virtualization display blazor component to render out the content of the text editor. So I go to text editor display dot razor. There we go. I'm going to close my other tabs. Uh, and in the text editor display dot razor, which is in the razor lib, and then in the text editor folder, and then text editor display dot razor. That's where I am. So we are currently just doing a for loop over every row that is in the text editor. And as I showed you in the beginning of this video, in the case of rendering out the play Hamlet as the dot HTML uh, in dot HTML form, that was 8,880 lines of text and in the previous video, we tried, uh, we didn't try, we, we measured uh, how long it took to render that uh, hamlet.html. And it took, I believe, more than 1.5 seconds. And then in, in the beginning of this video, I don't know what it was, maybe it was 100 milliseconds. So it's a massive difference. So instead of doing this for loop where we render everything and slow down the app drastically, we'll do the virtualization. So let me grab the namespace for the virtualization display. I go to virtualize this uh, virtualization display dot razor dot CS control home to go to the top of the page. I copy the namespace and then go back over to text editor display dot razor. I go to the top of the page. I say at using and then I paste the namespace for the virtualization display. I scroll down to where that for loop was that we were just looking at. I see some spacing here. I'm going to get rid of it. Just uh, unnecessary white space. Oh, I see why it was there. Okay. So I now have the namespace for the virtualization display. So I'll type virtualization display, put that on the page and I can hit space to start passing in some parameters. I want to give it an entries provider funk. So this will be uh, the method that we'll put in the code behind by refactoring it to be there because we don't have it yet. But this is going to be entries provider. And no parentheses because we're not invoking it. We're just giving a funk. So if I control period, writer will create this method in the code behind for me and it just needs a slight change. Instead of having a generic type for this method, I know what this type is going to be. Uh, the virtualization result will have the generic type of list of rich character. And I want this virtualization request argument 
to be called request. I can now control tab back to the dot razor. Make sure there's no other parameters here. We see there aren't. It's just those two optional use horizontal, use vertical, so that you can choose not to use them. The vertical, uh, the virtualization. And they're set to true by default, so we're good. I want to grab these inside this for loop that we had. We have two variables at the top. We have var index equals i and var row equals underscore rows at index. I will, I will, I'm going to cut those two variables and then put a razor code block inside of the child's content for the virtualization display. And then I will paste these two variables. That way, when I move everything over, we can keep the same variable names and uh, not have to change much. So now I can go to the for loop and I want to copy over, uh, specifically cut over all the innards of this for loop, all of the markup in this for loop. So that's what I'll do right now. So I control X, my selection, and like I said, it was all of the markup in this for loop. The for loop is now empty, and I'm going to now delete the for loop because of that. We will be using the virtualization display instead. Outside of the code block that declares and initializes these two variables named index and row, I want to paste what I cut from the for loop. I can then hit control KD to format my file. And I scroll back up. I find the starting tag for the virtualization display. I see that var index, uh, that is to say at the beginning of the child content for virtualization display, I have a razor code block and var index equal to I is not compiling because I does not exist. So if you type in here context, you see that I get this variable that is of type virtualization entry, list of rich character, I could do a period, and then I could say index. And uh, that works great. But additionally, what you could do is you can rename this context uh, variable uh, that gets provided to you as a result of your render fragment taking a generic type, you can access that generic type parameter by saying context. But I don't want it to say context. Uh, that's uh, doesn't have any meaning to me. So I, in the starting tag for the virtualization display, after my entries provider func blazer parameter, I could say a uh, attribute in which capital C context equals virtualized row. So context equals virtualized row. And now you see context is no longer available because I instead have to use virtualized row. But now it has a bit more meaning to me. So now I have index variable. That's looking good. The actual row itself will be virtualized row dot item. And there we go. Here we see a usage of I and that's not compiling. It's the last thing that's not compiling. Uh, I believe it should say index because we have that index variable. If I scroll back up, uh, var index. So that looks good. We had, uh, we need to add some logic to the if statement that wraps this virtualization display because in the case that the character width and row height as well, the text editor width and height, if those are not measured, uh, then we don't want to actually render the virtualization yet. 
we want to wait until they actually get measured. So, uh, and uh, just very quickly, uh, we have JavaScript in the on after render of the text editor display code behind that invokes JavaScript to measure the width of a singular character. That is to say this monospaced font that's being used in the text editor, as well the height of a row, the width of the editor, and the height of the editor. And if that's not done yet, we don't want to render the virtualization display because the virtualization display is dependent on those measurements. So in this if statement that we have that was wrapping everything, uh, this virtualization display, I want to add here if underscore character width and row height is not null and underscore text editor width and height is not null and the rows is not null and the rows has something in it. Um, so the next thing to do is to make the logic for the entries provider. So I'll F12 uh, in the header tag for the virtualization display, we have that entries provider func and then we give it entries provider. I'll F12 to entries provider and inside of the entries provider. Uh, this will never actually happen, but if we don't put what I'm about to put, we will get a warning uh, in regards to nullable reference types. Uh, and it's a completely reasonable warning. Uh, so just to have it not show up. Because it's a weird situation that we're that we're in here. We have this entries provider being invoked by something that's being wrapped in the dot razor. That is to say, in the dot razor, we are making sure that these values are not null. But rightfully so, the compiler is probably looking at this and saying, "I don't care. Uh, this is sketchy." Uh, in the sense that anyone could technically call this and give you a null value. So. But we're only going to call it from that inner if block of the dot razor that does the check. So that's why I'm going to put this. So just to get rid of the warning. If underscore character width and row height is null or underscore text editor width and height is null, then I return return null. And now we need to actually modify. Uh, I suppose the wording would be the nullable references uh, declarations that we have. Uh, I, 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 di I didn't mark uh, some of the things with that. But like I said, I wanted to go sequentially in kind of a story, uh, even though I saw them as we were going through it. So let's do that now. We need to modify the return type of the entries provider to be nullable. And we need to go to virtualization display dot razor dot cs just for a moment. The entries provider func blazor parameter. Uh, the return of this func needs to be nullable. And then I scroll down in virtualization display dot razor dot cs. We need to say if the entries provider func dot invoke underscore request uh, returned a null value, that has two reasons. One, something is like wrong on the consumer's end, which a specific example of that would be if the character width and row height were to be null, something is wrong on our end, so we can't do anything, we just return null. But the other option would be request dot cancellation token dot is cancellation requested uh, and you could put this uh, check to see if the cancellation token is cancelled uh, wherever it fits for you but that's one of the other cases in which you would return null and in that situation you want 
the virtualization display to ignore that result. So I'll say var local result is equal to instead of immediately setting underscore result to entry provider func dot invoke and then passing the request, I then instead grab that as a local result and then if the local result is not null in that case we would then say underscore result is equal to local result and invoke async state is changed we need to do invoke async state is changed because we don't know what thread the caller of this method is on uh, as a result of this being public so we need to invoke async state is changed so we know we can be on the UI thread we go to the entries provider uh, we go back to the entries provider uh, method that's in text editor display dot razor dot CS I need a variable for local text editor and that comes from text editor states selection dot value. Uh, this application, uh, we are using Fluxer and there's a link in the description if you don't know what Fluxer is uh, so that you can read up on it. But it's a state management uh, library and you inject your state and then you grab it uh, in short. So we need to grab our state and say bar local text editor We need a vertical starting index, and that's going to be equal to, I'll write it in kind of a story form. Uh, what we would want to do for the vertical starting index is take the scroll top. So the scroll top would be request dot scroll position dot scroll top in pixels. And then we want to divide this by the row height and specifically the row height would be underscore character width and row height we have this field that we uh, set when we called the JavaScript to measure this information and I do underscore character width and row height dot element height in pixels and what this is saying is I want the scroll top divided by the row height however that's not everything that needs to be done here because if it's the case that I have my scroll bar this is kind of hard to do there we go you can see line 473 currently on my screen you can't see all of it uh, maybe if I were to throw out a number it would be you see 50 percent of it but no matter what at the end of the day we need to do a dot floor that is to say math dot floor so that way if there's anything that just ever so slightly is shown, we still take that and return it. So for that reasoning, I'll do a vertical starting index equals math.floor. And then I'll put in the math.floor the scroll top divided by the row height. I'm going to try to format these things so that you can see them on screen because of the fact that uh, I have to zoom in very far uh, for the videos so I kind of have these formatted weird because I don't want them to go off screen for the video so now the final part for the vertical starting index is it's an index uh, so we can't have this be a double if I hover over the var uh, perhaps it tells me uh, yes it it's still of type double so we just cast it as an int and that's fine because we already floored it uh, and perhaps casting it to an int would truncate it and do the same thing as math.floor but I'm gonna do math.ceiling in a moment so it just made sense so let's see bar so now we uh, we have the starting index uh, the vertical starting index we need the vertical take that's gonna be equal to we're gonna end up casting it as an int uh, I'm going to go faster this time because I went through kind of slow the first one. Uh, and 
This time we want math.ceiling because the situation would be, let me see if I can get one off screen. This is as good as I can do. I don't want to take too much time, but we see what I'm talking about. The line 484, I can kind of see it, but not entirely. So for that reason, we do a math.ceiling in this case, whereas for the starting index, we did a math.floor. So this is going to be the text editor height divided by the row height. Uh, so almost in a sense, how many rows can I fit in my viewport? Uh, the, the scrollable viewport. I'm using the word view, viewport kind of uh, informally uh, when I say that. Because it means something else. All right. So the text editor height is underscore text editor within height dot height in pixels divided by, if we want to get the row height, it's underscore character width and row height dot element height in pixels. And then I'll format this a little awkwardly just so it can show up even though the font size is massive. Uh, okay. We need to make sure that the vertical starting index plus the vertical take is within the bounds of the text editor's uh, array I'll leave it at that because uh, it's a bit of an awkward situation because there's actually no such thing as the rows. Uh, it kind of gets calculated when you ask for it. So it's a bit awkward to this. That's off track. All right. Sorry. Um, so what we need to do here is say if the vertical starting index plus the vertical take is greater than the local text editor dot row ending positions dot length then we're gonna have a problem we'll get an index out of bounds exception so we would then end up saying well let's take as much as we can so that would be the row ending positions length minus the vertical starting index we would then take our vertical take and set the vertical take equal to that. So the vertical take, if it would result in us being out of bounds, we modify the mu the uh, vertical take to be the row ending positions dot length minus the starting index. So as much as we can take. This next line is less likely to happen when it comes to the vertical virtualization. Uh, but you'll see it far more important when we do the horizontal one, but I will still put it here. Okay. Um, oh yeah. So if it's the case that when we do the row ending positions dot length minus the vertical starting index, if that results in a negative vertical take, we need to uh, instead set the vertical take to zero. Otherwise, we can take that positive value of whatever the vertical take currently is. Okay, the horizontal starting index is equal to, uh, we're gonna cast as an int math.floor, and this one will be request.scrollposition.scroll left. It's pretty much identical to the vertical ones. It's like a mirror image, but you're getting the left instead of the top, and you're getting the width instead of the height. It's pretty much a mirror image. Uh, and yeah, character width. And then the horizontal take, 
be next. Vor horizontal take equals. We need an uh, an integer, so I'll cast it as an int. I need math dot ceiling. I need the text editor width and height divided by the width of a character. So how many characters do I need to fill the, the, the scrollable viewport is effectively what this horizontal take is saying. If I use the word viewport informally like that, uh, that is to say. And so here I have text editor width and height. I forgot to put a period and then access the property width and pixels. That's what that was. We need to get the virtualized entries equal to local text editor. We have this get rows uh, method on the text editor class and we give it if I control shift space to show the uh, method parameters it is starting row index comma count. So this would be the vertical starting index comma the vertical take and we're not done yet uh, continuing uh, immediately after that dot get rows is another method call for dot select this dot select needs the row and the index you can specify the row and index when you do link by just putting a parentheses and in there putting two names for the corresponding variables and then you'll, you'll get both of them instead of just the row if you only put one so and this will go to a code block I need to say a local horizontal take because these rows are of varying length so local horizontal take is equal to horizontal take if the horizontal starting index plus the local horizontal take is greater than this current rows count then I need to change the amount that I'm taking uh, locally in regards to this row specifically because I can't take as much because there's less on this row for whatever reason so that would be local horizontal take is equal to row dot count minus horizontal starting index and the result of this is you might end up with a negative number uh, so we do math dot max we pass in zero and the local horizontal take so if local horizontal take is positive and greater than zero we keep its value otherwise we make it zero because it was a negative value we need to say uh, we need to horizontally virtualize the row so the individual rows so that's what I'm going to do here this is horizontally virtualized row I take the row I and this row is a list of rich character uh, if you don't uh, if you haven't seen what a rich character is it is just a class that has a property of type char and a property of type byte and it is the first property is named value, the second property is named decoration byte, the second property is how we color things and syntax highlight. So I need to skip the horizontal starting index. I need to take the local horizontal take and then I do a dot to list at the end. I need to make a virtualization entry of a generic type list which is of generic type rich character so I return new virtualization entry list rich character and I need to give to this virtualization entry constructor 
the index that I'm at. And this index is actually wrong, but I'll keep with the story mindset and get there when we get there. Uh, it's just slightly wrong. We need to give it the uh, horizontally virtualized row, which is the item. And then we need the width in pixels. The width in pixels would be whatever the horizontally virtualized row ended up being. Uh, the count of that times the width of a character. That tells you how wide it's going to be. The height is going to be the row height. So that would be character width and row height dot element height in pixels. The left in pixels will be the horizontal starting index times the character width. And the top is going to be the index of this row times the height of a row. So now we finished with that dot select. I'll scroll up a bit. We have var virtualized entries is equal to local text editor dot get rows. This dot get rows is where we do the vertical virtualization. Uh, and then in uh, then with the result of get rows, we do a dot select in which we do the horizontal virtualization. And at the end of all of this, at the end of the select, we need to do dot two immutable array because that's what the result, the virtualization result wants an immutable array. So we do dot two immutable array. All right, uh, we need to figure out what the left boundary will be, the right boundary, the top boundary, the bottom boundary. Uh, the left boundary would be on the left side of the user's monitor. Uh, well, more specifically, the viewport of the scrollable area. And for that reasoning, it would have a height that is equal to null because null means 100%. And I'm going to fill out the ones that are obvious and don't need to be calculated, sort of the constants of the boundaries. I'll fill them out first. The width needs to be calculated. The left does not need to be calculated. It is always going to be at left of zero. It's always going to be touching the wall, so to speak, on the left. The top is always going to be zero. And the other thing is that the height is always going to be 100%. It's just a question of how how wide is this left boundary going to be that spans from uh, the left boundary spans from the left most position in your scrollable uh, element HTML element. It has a width all the way up to in short, you could almost say up to the scroll left position, but it's slightly different than that because we do this math.floor, we need to account for the fact that we may have rounded. So instead of using uh, left boundary dot width and pixels equals scroll left, we instead say left boundary dot width and pixels equals the horizontal starting index times the width of a character. And that gets us just ever so slightly a more accurate left boundary in the case that we may have rounded down. So the right boundary has a height of null because it would just be a straight vertical line on the right side of the, of the scrollable view, viewport. Uh, the left would be 
the right boundary that left in pixels is going to be the left boundary that left in pixels plus the width of the content that got rendered. And we'll do that in a moment. And the width in pixels of the right boundary is 100% of that scrollable area, the total width in pixels of the scrollable area minus, this is almost recursive, but this is how I look at it. You would take the right boundary dot left in pixels, uh, total width minus myself's left in pixels. Uh, I'm going to write all these out in reality in a moment. The top in pixels would be zero. The top boundary has a left in pixels of zero, a top in pixels of, z of zero, a width of null because that means 100%. The bottom boundary has a width of null because that means 100%. It has a unknown height until we calculate it, unknown top until we calculate it, and the left would be zero. So now I can uncomment these and I'll go through this. The left uh, boundary, the left virtualization boundary is going to have a width that is equal to the horizontal, uh, horizontal starting index times the character width and row height dot font width in pixels and then the height will be 100% because it's a vertical line. It will start at the leftmost position and the topmost position. The right virtual boundary is going to have a width that is equal to the left boundary, whatever the left boundary has as its uh, width in pixels because we're going to be offset by that and then we're going to be offset by the width of the content that was rendered. I have it backwards. Uh, I'm doing the left in pixels in my mind so sorry about that. Uh, let, let me fill out the left in pixels which is what I thought I was filling out. So the left in pixels for the right boundary would be the left boundary dot within pixels plus whatever the width of the content is that was rendered. So character width and row height dot font width in pixels times the horizontal take. And for the right boundary, we need to either copy and paste uh, what I have highlighted, this calculation, or we can make a variable out of it. Say var right boundary left in pixels is equal to, and then paste it. And now we can reference the right boundary left in pixels when we calculate the width in pixels. The width in pixels would be whatever you're offset by on the left, whatever is remaining, that ends up being your width. So we need to know the total width minus whatever my offset left is. We find the total width by, I need to scroll up a little bit and find the local text editor, I F12 that var keyword and it brings me to the text editor base. I scroll down to where the properties are. I then make a property that is public and it will be int uh, and it will be most characters on a single row. It has a getter and a private setter. I then copy this most characters on a single row property. I scroll up to the constructor of the text editor base. I need to, when I 
make this text editor, I have a constructor and it iterates over every character in the string content that you give the constructor to find the various line endings and to construct those rich characters. So during this constructing phase, I can count however many characters are on a row so I know the most characters on a single row and if the font is monospace then the total width would be the most characters on a single row times the width of a character so let's do that for characters on row is equal to zero and inside of this for loop after I grab a character out of the content using my at index from the for loop, I can say characters on row plus plus. And every time that I see a new line, I would want to say if the characters on row is greater than the most characters on a single row, then most characters on a single row is going to be overridden by that characters on row because this is the longest row now and we would have to reset characters on row to zero and this if uh, and then set to zero logic is identical uh, when it comes to seeing a new line character because this first if statement is a carriage return this else if is a new line and down here we see the row index plus plus so I paste and if you have carriage return new line, it is possibly the case that you would want to add one more to your characters on row. I am going to treat car carriage return and new line as of right now as just one character in regards to most characters on a single row. So we are done with that. I go back to the entries provider in my text editor display .razor.cs and then I scroll back down to where I'm calculating these boundaries and prior to the left boundary which is the first one that we were calculating I can say var total width is equal to local text editor dot most characters on a single row times underscore character width and row height dot font size in pixels and now we know the total width let's find the total height for total height is equal to the local text editor dot row ending positions dot length these are all of the rows where do they occur and if it's where all the row endings occur if we take the length of that we have the amount of rows that are in the document we then multiply by the height of a row and we found the total height so local text editor dot row ending positions dot length times underscore character width and row height dot element height in pixels Now we have the total width and we have the total height and our right boundary, as I said, the right boundary is going to be the total width minus whatever the right boundaries left in pixels is. So we, we want this almost like recursive uh, reference here. So I set the, the this variable for the right boundary and for the right boundary left in pixels prior to doing the constructor for the actual right boundary so I can reference it twice. The top boundary is a width of 100% and that's why it says null. And the height is the scroll top. And I gotta catch myself here. Uh, it's very tempting to say the scroll top, but we might have rounded down so for that reasoning that we may have rounded down you don't use the scroll top you instead use the vertical starting index which might be like in our case each row is 30 pixels maybe we rounded down by like 15 pixels all of a sudden if we used the scroll top our top boundary would be in the wrong spot by 15 pixels because we rounded Vertical starting index times 
character width and row height times element height in pixels because this would be the row. That's the top. Left in pixels is zero. Top in pixels is zero. The bottom boundary is going to have a width of 100%. It's going to have a height that is equal to 100% of the total height in pixels minus uh, the top boundary height and then additionally minus the height of the content that was rendered. So that would be total height minus the top boundary dot height minus the um, height of the content. I was thinking about the difference between the height and the top and the fact that I want to make a variable. Um, so let me do that. I want to do the top first. Uh, it just makes more sense if you do the top first. So similarly to how we have this var right boundary left in pixels, I want a var bottom boundary top in pixels because we need the top in pixels when we calculate the height. So why not just store it in one spot and then reference it twice? Uh, that's kind of why I like froze there thinking for a bit. Uh, so bottom boundary top in pixels and this is going to be the top boundary height in pixels plus the height of a row times the amount of rows taken which is the vertical take and now we can reference this twice so the height would be the total height minus the bottom boundary top in pixels. And then the top in pixels would be this variable that we just made, bottom boundary top in pixels. We now have all of the boundaries made. We return a new virtualization result. This virtualization result needs the virtualized entries that we made. It needs the left boundary the right boundary, the top boundary, the bottom boundary. That might be it. For some reason, my notes end. Let's see. No, that's not it. Uh, okay, I'm going to pause the video and figure out where I put the rest of the notes. I will be right back. Pause. Okay, I know what the problem is. I, firstly, I just hit Control Z to undo my fix, uh, so I could show you it. In virtualization display dot razor, the virtualization boundary display takes a Blazor parameter named virtualization boundary display ID virtualization boundary display ID is a string and I tried giving it a property that is in the code behind but I, I never put an at sign so this property name is literally being used because it, it, it wants it to be a string so let me put the at sign for these uh, virtualization boundary display IDs. Just gotta put the at sign. So I reference the variable instead of writing out the variable name as the ID. So that was one thing. 
The second thing was I never invoked entries provider func. So that's kind of important. Uh, so let's go do that. So on in virtualization display dot razor dot cs we have the on scroll event and the entire idea is that on scroll event we invoke the entries provider func and get the new data to render but i never actually invoked the entries provider func so i'll just paste here invoke entries provider func and call that method that we have call that from within the on scroll event async and then I run it and you'll see there's one last thing that's wrong and you can see as I scroll uh, the contents moving but the actual indices at which all these things lie are not changing uh, I'll show you again uh, very quickly it goes from 1 to 12 in terms of the line number and the content changes if I scroll but the line numbers stay the same and therefore if it thinks that it's line number 1 it renders it at where li line number 1 should be uh, so all this is is a matter of let me get the file open uh, in text editor display when we do the dot select we are doing it on the result of dot get rows. Dot get rows is going to do the vertical virtualization. Therefore, the indexes that we receive when we do the link dot select are not accurate when we look respectively to the original list prior to the virtualization vertically. We want those indices, not the indices after the virtualization occurred. So what needs to be done here is, I'm not sure if it's weird like this to mutate the index that's being given to you as a parameter from link, but I will do it uh, for now. And I'm gonna do uh, this link index that they give me I have to add to it the vertical starting index and then we'll see everything's working and then I'll open Hamlet uh, after I show you that it, that it works and then we'll be at where we started uh, this video at so I scroll and you can see I can get to the bottom of the page it says EOF um, and if I right click I'll show you this and then I'll open up Hamlet like I said but I think it's pretty cool to look at the weapon specter, uh, as, it's, as it's called here on this machine. Uh, as I'm scrolling, we can see the top value is changing. Uh, I believe I have this very zoomed in. Hopefully, it shows up. Um, that was not very bright. All right, I was trying to make it better. I, I made it horribly worse. Uh, but as I scroll through here, it's going more and more top as time goes on because I'm going deeper and deeper into the file and deeper and deeper with the scroll bar. So, okay. I'm going to open up Hamlet. Let's see what that looks like. Again, I think it was like more than 1.5 seconds to render Hamlet that HTML uh, in the previous video. So where is that guy at? Oh my goodness, I'm searching Hamlet. Text editor states, for some reason I don't have this in the notes, the link. So let me get it real quick. Um, I know where to get it. It's home, documents, temporary. Uh, I keep all the videos as like temporary notes and then I finalize them in the actual repo itself because if I change my branch, I'll end up losing 
the video notes, so I keep them separately from the repo so I can change my branch freely, and then I finalize them and actually put the finalized notes when I'm done with the video. Okay, here's hamlet.html. I run it, and... Yeah, 88 milliseconds. So let me run it again. There it is. It doesn't show up until I click on this notification that says Blazor Text Editor is ready. Um, or I can click on it in the taskbar, but... Here you see, 81 milliseconds. And things very responsive. Uh, I can highlight the text and all that. Um, and I believe in the beginning of the video, I scrolled to the bottom, so let's do that. Uh, you can see I scroll through this, and I'll do it a little bit. I don't know if it's bothering some, somebody's eyes if I do this, so I'm a little worried about that. But I also want you to see that it's all here. Um, and... Yeah, there we go. Uh, 8,880 lines. Uh, and then we see the end of file. We got it down from, I believe it was more than 1.5 seconds, down to just 81 milliseconds. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so that's the end of this video. Uh, so thank you and goodbye.